Hello and welcome to another episode of the AABIP podcast. This is Udit Chada, an assistant professor of medicine and thoracic surgery at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. Uh, during these podcast episodes, we uh, discuss unique and often controversial topics in IP. The topics discussed often do not have a high quality evidence base, and we seek opinions from our invited experts to learn their approach to specific clinical scenarios. The views expressed are exclusively those of the speakers and not necessarily endorsed by the AABIP. For today's discussion, we have Aladdin Sagar and Matt Abudera with us. Ala and Matt, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Rich, for having us. Perfect. Uh, Ala, do you have any conflicts of interest to disclose before we start? No, no conflicts of interest. Perfect. And Matt, what about you? I do some consulting work for Medtronic, but nothing specific to this topic today. Okay, let's get started then. So our topic uh, for discussion today is plural procedures, how I do it. And the I in this is Matt and Allah, uh, who are our experts uh, whom we will pick their brains about. So we will cover thoracentesis, chest tubes, and pleuroscopy, but what we will not cover in this uh, podcast is IPCs, pleurodesis, or the administration of intrapleural therapies like TP and DNAs. So uh, Allah, let's get started with you. When performing a thoracentesis, what do you use to drain the fluid? Do you use hand suction, gravity drainage, wall suction, vacuum bottles, and why? Well, now I'm normally with thoracentesis, um, I use wall suction. Um, sometimes I use vacuum bottles, but you, most of the time I use a suction-based method. And um, I'm sure there's going to be different opinions about that. But the way I look at it is that, you know, whenever you're deciding between one approach versus the other, you're weighing the pros and cons. So is there a benefit of one approach versus the other? And in this particular case, you know, you can argue that suction has a benefit of time. Um, and I think the gravity study, study that was done at Vanderbilt did show that the average time of doing a thoracentesis with suction was significantly faster compared to gravity, which is not unexpected. Now, that may or may not be clinically significant, depending on how many thoracentheses you do on a daily basis and what's the volume of procedures that you're doing. Then the other question is, is there any potential harm of doing suction? And again, you know, you may have um, some debate about that, but the fact of the matter is we don't have any clear evidence to show that there is any worsening discomfort, which again, the graphitis did not uh, show. There was a study um, published in the GOBIP, I think a year ago, that suggested that there is um, higher incidence of pneumothorax uh, with patients um, who had the procedure done with suction. But the, the number of patients in that study was very small to actually make some solid um, inferences. In fact, we actually looked at um, the MD Anderson population over a course of more than 10 years. We had 10,000 patients. And the uh, complications were pretty similar to what was um, reported in the literature with uh, gravity. Any utility in doing gravity-dependent drainage? I mean, gravity drainage just does sound more physiological. Would you ever use gravity drainage? I think, you know, if you're suspecting trapped lung and, you know, you're concerned about the pain with the, uh, with the suction in those particular cases, you know, you can make an argument of, you know, just leaving it to gravity. Again, you know, I don't see any clear... Um, harm of using the suction, at least based on the, the data that we have. So I'm not, I'm not sure if there's any particular case in that I would strongly recommend gravity versus, um, versus suction. Mm -hmm. And when do you stop draining the fluid? So in the retrospective study that we did, all the uh, patients um, had their drainage stopped either because there was no more fluid left or if they had symptoms. And most of the symptoms are either a chronic persistent, a persistent cough or um, significant shortness of breath, chest tightness, or chest pain. Um, we did not use pleuromanometry in those patients. And, um, you know, the incidence of re-expansion of pulmonary edema, which is probably the most dreaded uh, complication, especially with using suction, uh, was less than a zero point. It was, I believe it was 0.08%. Matt, uh, any different uh, approach that you take? No, I tend to agree with all. I mean, I think in terms of approaching how, how I'm going to drain these patients, also for me is practicality. What do I have available in my in my procedure room, uh, on the hospital ward, or wherever I'm doing the the thoracentesis? Um, so practicality plays a plays a huge uh, role into how I'm going to drain these patients. And two, you know, certainly complications and patient comfort. Um, you know, I agree with Allah. There isn't really, I mean, complications. Um, the differences between all of these is is 
probably not um, um, from what we know already. Uh, and it's really hard to know from a pneumothorax rate. Sometimes it'd be definitive about why that pneumothorax is there. Is it pneumothorax ex vacuo? Is it truly uh, induced by some kind of visceral um, pleural injury? So uh, I think um, that's also plays a role, but also I think patient comfort. Um, I think that's, you know, I'll re refer to the, the Gravitas uh, study was looking at patient centered outcomes in that in terms of, um, in terms of pain before and after uh, the drainage procedure. So I think that's an important thing too. So I typically will do a hand suction. That's just what we have in my procedure room. So that's what I'll do. Um, I've done suction bottles as well. Um, and uh, I rarely do gravity drainage. It's only a very specific circumstance. It takes too long for me. I'm just mm -hmm. too impatient to sit around and, and wait for all this uh, liter and a half of fluid to slowly drain out of the chest. Um, but if there's a, a situation where that does need to happen for the patient, um, that's uh, I, I you know I, I do that. But but it's infrequent that I would end up um, uh, using a pure gravity uh, drainage mm -hmm. method. Yeah. Uh, I think. Um, I, I personally sort of like the hand suction method in a way, just because I can. Um, granted, if I'm if I'm really just on, on a roll and just draining out fluid, um, you run into the same theoretical issues if it was on suction. But mm -hmm. I feel like I have a little bit of better control in terms of monitoring patient symptoms, because um, if they start to develop symptoms related to uh, unexpandable lung, then uh, I, I just will pause and and or end up stopping the procedure. And that's one of the mm -hmm. reasons I'll end up stopping drainage fluid is if they have a lot of um, anterior chest pain, if they have a persistent cough that's not going away with manipulation of the catheter, um, I'll stop draining that. And, uh, or and it's very I, identical to ALA is if all the fluid, if I'm able to get all the fluid out without any, uh, uh, any issues, I'll, that's when I'll end up stopping, so. Mm -hmm. Perfect, so I guess it's around the, the main reason to use uh something other than gravity is time. Uh, what I do, the only time I do use gravity is for time. If I'm doing like a bilateral photosynthesis, you know, I'll, on the first side, I'll start with gravity, let it drain, and then I'll stab the other side and do hand suction okay. over there. So you're doing it for the same purpose of, of time. That we do exactly, time. exactly, yeah. exactly. All yeah. of us are too impatient. All yeah. right. <laughs> you know, uh, one thing, one thing that's interesting of the sort of the evolution of draining fluid is, is that at least in residency, I was taught is that in terms of stop draining the fluid, you don't, stop at a liter and a half uh, mm -hmm. or a liter or a liter and a half. Don't do that anymore. Or, you know, don't go beyond that. That's um, <clears throat> you're going to, you're going to run into re-expansion pulmonary edema. And that's, we sort of <clears throat> in sort of have some degree um, started trying to drain out as much fluid as possible. And if we're draining more than a liter and a half, then we can mm -hmm. do that as long as they're tolerating it yeah. um, from a symptom standpoint, you don't have a strong physiological reason that you may develop uh, re-expansion pulmonary edema. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think um, I agree with Matt in terms of kind of creating that arbitrary one and a half liter to stop draining fluid. In fact, the, uh, the retrospective study that we did uh, that was published in ERJ last month, mm -hmm. we had patients who had drainage of two liters and above. And, um, you know, granted that we only had eight cases of re-expansion pulmonary edema out of 10,000. So kind of making... Um, you know, statistical, you know, calculations a little bit more challenging because your confidence intervals are wide. But you'll see that there's only a very slight increase in risk of re-expansion pulmonary edema, which is very small in the grand scheme of the amount, the number of procedures that you do. So, and on the other hand, you have the benefit of draining as much fluid as you can, which may potentially improve the patient's symptoms and also may allow you to have a better idea of whether the lung is completely expandable or not, which may alter your decisions in terms of how to approach pleurodesis if needed. So let's go to another dogma. Uh, what about performing thoracentesis on patients who are on dual antiplatelet agents, aspirin and Plavix or aspirin and Prasugrel or uh, Ticagrel or, uh, or one of the newer anticoagulant agents? Uh, Matt, what's your approach in such patients if you cannot hold the anticoagulant or mm -hmm. the uh, second uh, antiplatelet agent? Uh, so I think it depends upon <clears throat> the the clinical situation. I think if if patients on a on a, a novel oral anticoagulant or a dual antiplatelet therapy and they clinically need a thoracentesis, they have an, a concern for an empyema, um, mm -hmm. or they're um, significantly symptomatic and they need some drainage of the of, of fluid uh, to feel better to prevent any impending respiratory failure or other complications. And then yes, I'll go ahead and do the thoracentesis. Um, 
um, with the with those patients. I know that there there's several studies looking at you know prospective, retrospective, um, but all small, uh, small, yeah, looking at them and and looking in and see the and even in mild coagulopathy if this is going to be safe or not. And overall, they seem seem to suggest that there there is some degree of safety with it. We don't know for certain. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you know the theoretical um, or the th- concern. I should say theoretical, but the concern for it would be let's say a hemothorax and um, typically if I'm approaching it, I guess I, I, um, I usually use a small, a small bore, um, Thorson, uh, catheter. So, mm-hmm. um, I, we use both a care fusion and an arrow kit. And so I'll use either a care fusion five French catheter, or I'll use a use synthesis five French catheter. If they're, if they're anticoagulated or if they're, they got their body habitus or I, um, have some concerns, um, about entering the portal space then I may use a, a smaller catheter. Um, um, so from a hemothorax standpoint, you know, the, I guess my, my risk in terms of hitting an intercostal artery doesn't really change if they're on a, if they're on one of these agents, I guess the issue would be is if I did hit that, that artery and they're, and they're bleeding comp- after that. Um, and I think that's a very low risk, um, for that occurring. If it's, if you're approaching it, um, uh, in a, in a safe spot, uh, uh, a point of entry. So, um, but yeah, in general, I will approach them if it needs to get done. Um, and I can't stop the oral anticoagulant. I think it would depend upon the patient situation, um, how symptomatic they are and the clinical need for, for getting fluid and for making them symptomatically uh, feel better. And if you do decide to go for it, you'd or on the side of using a smaller gauge, um, uh, or smaller French, um, uh, catheter. So, I do. I yeah. do. Yeah. I use the same one. I use the Thora Para 5 French uh, catheter drainage tray uh, from Care Fusion if I'm using it and someone with uh, risk of bleeding, even with someone who's thrombocytopenic, for example. Um, but if, if, if there's no contraindication, then, uh, you know, time is of the essence and I'll use the 8 French arrow kit. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, so, so let's move on to another uh, aspect of bleeding. Ala, do you routinely do a pre-procedure ultrasound to look at intercostal vascular anatomy? Um, I try to. I, I, I don't probably do it routinely, but I try as much as possible to evaluate the, um, the intercostal vessels as much as I can um, mm-hmm. to you know, look and make sure that there's no clear vessel that's in the way when doing those procedures. Um, I haven't implemented it routinely, but, you know, it's, it's kind of like a habit that I'm trying to have it, you know, within my... Uh, routine performance for the procedure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I had a hemothorax about four or five months back. And since then, I have routinely been doing it. And uh, I, I can tell you that it, I've changed my site of entry maybe about five times in five months uh, because I see, I see a you know, malposition intercostal vessel, but it, uh, I've sort of changed my practice after I had that complication. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely fair. I mean, that's a that's a legit reason to uh, change your practice. Absolutely. Um, all right. So uh, let's move on to chest tubes then. So when placing pigtail catheters, uh, do you use a different size pigtail for a pneumothorax, for a sonographically simple pleural effusion, for a complicated paraneumonic effusion or empyema? Matt, what's your practice? Sure. I would say that it depends upon the etiology of the pneumothorax. Um uh, so if it's a post-procedural pneumothorax from a bronchoscopy or transbronchial biopsies, and um, I'll use a small, I'll use actually use a Furman, um, eight and a half French, um, small little pigtail catheter. Um, I'll use that and usually have pretty good success with that mm-hmm. um, for post-procedural pneumothoraces. Um, if it's a <clears throat> pneumothorax related to like a post-endobronchial valve for emphysema, um, I think those uh, pigtail catheters personally and the uh, pneumothoraces that I've had with with placing valves um, in those patients are are not sub- are not substantial enough. I think you need a larger um, chest tube for that. I've I've had success in those patients just by using the 14 French Wayne pneumothorax, mm-hmm. um, uh, and and uh, to approach those. In some cases, I've had to go up to higher, uh, larger bore, um, uh, cut down uh, thoracostomy chest tubes. But by and large, I can get by with uh, 14 French uh, Wayne pneumothorax uh, for those patients. Um, for a simple pleural effusion, like let's say um, consulted, they got a heart failure patient and um, they want, uh, they got bilateral pleural effusions or a large pleural effusion. It's been 
maybe tapped a couple of times and just want to have a, a tube in for whatever particular reason. I'll, again, I'll use a small bore, probably an eight and a half French tube. Um, and that seems to work pretty good for a simple free flowing um, pleural effusion to at least keep the fluid out. Assuming it's not getting kinked, assuming, you know, there isn't any issues related to that. Mm -hmm. um, that's uh, that's uh, how I'll approach those. Um, for a parenomonic effusion or empyema, um, you know, uh, again, I think I've, I've had success with the 14 French Wayne um, uh, pigtail. I've had some pretty, pretty dense septated uh, plurions. You know, I place the place the tube and nothing, you know, nothing comes out. Um, and in, instilling TPA and DNA and have been able to get resolution, uh, a pretty good response um, with just that size chest tube. Um, uh, I think that seems to that seems to do the trick uh, reasonably well. I haven't had to change uh, chest tubes very often with that, or upsize it, or, or make any adjustments. So that seems to be working pretty well. Sometimes to my surprise, um, but but it, that seems to be pretty much my go-to one for that. Mm -hmm. I mean that's consistent with uh, MIST one and MIST two and their subgroup analysis. Uh, I, the only time I would probably go for a larger bore tube is you know when you're aspirating stuff that looks really thick and you know at that moment it's not guideline consistent or study consistent but that's the only time i think in a complicated paranemonic or effusion or an empyema where i'd want to put a larger tube so allah when you're putting a larger tube in what what's a large tube is it a 24 28 32 36 uh, honestly speaking, most of the time I'm only using the 14. The only time I uh -huh. sometimes use the, the 20 or 24, 26 is sometimes after like a pleuroscopy and I want to leave a chest tube. For um, regular empyemas, pneumonic fusions, um, I would just put a 14 French. Never had issues so far, at least with, with that. In an awake patient, when you're putting in a large bore tube, do you guys give any IV sedation or analgesia? I um, I do not. I just use lidocaine. I um, numb up the, um, the ribs and so forth around there pretty well with, with lidocaine. And so unless, you know, um, it, it's really patient specific, to be honest. It's, it's just really, if they're really anxious, then I'll give them a little bit of some IV sedation. Mm -hmm. um, but it's yeah. not common. Um, usually I can get by with an, I think enough lidocaine and it's put in the, in the right area. I think you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this Personally, is, uh, go on, sorry. Go no, I was just going to say, personally, for the like the Wayne pneumothorax or kits and, you know, the small pig I, I won't. But if I'm placing a large chest tube, um, I normally would. Again, it's, I mean, the patient, what they remember is the experience. So I try to make it as, as comfortable as possible to them. Yeah, that's my practice, too. And this is also, uh, you know, the first large port tube I put in. I had a patient really scream a lot. So so after that, I've, I've always uh, resorted to at least 25 to 50 of fentanyl uh, before putting in a large port tube. Anyway, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, it for the chest tubes. Let's move on to pleuroscopy. So, Allah, uh, going on to your point of pl uh, placing a chest tube. So you do place a chest tube at the end of pleuroscopy. Do you take it out in your... Uh, Bronx Sweet OR, or do you take it out in the PACU? I normally take it out in the PACU. I mean, you can argue that there is no reason why once there's no bubbles and after you, you know, suction all the, um, the air that um, you cannot remove it in the OR. But it's just been a routine to get a chest x-ray and then remove the chest tube in the PACU. That's just been our practice. And uh, Allah, uh, sorry, and Matt, do you do anything different? Um, usually when I'm doing... Uh, pleuroscopy, the vast majority of the time I'm placing a pleurex. Um, so at the same time, for the, mm -hmm. um, so it's only in certain circumstances where I'm placing a chest tube. So, so yeah, the, pleur the pleurex is usually staying in. And then uh, Matt, so when you're doing pleuroscopy, are you using conscious sedation in all your cases? Uh, some cases, general anesthesia, do you prefer an approach over the other? I use uh, I use uh, moderate anesthesia, um, so I'll have anesthesia there, and and they'll give propofol or maybe give some fentanyl, um, but I don't use general anesthesia. So, um, and they seem to tolerate that pretty good. And what kind of uh, airway or no airway are you using? Uh, basically, nasal cannula or uh, some sort yeah, of face mask. Yeah, just a face mask and oxy mask, um, and uh, and. And the anesthesia provider will will uh, you know support the airway a little bit if they if the patient needs it or um, so that's pretty much it. Don't need any haven't used had to use any any more advanced airway than that. What about you, Allah? Anything different? 
Um, yeah, so we we do our proscopies in two different hospitals, and I think what other the other factor that has to be taken into consideration is all the comfort of the anesthesia team that you're mm-hmm. working with. So uh, some of our anesthesia providers are more comfortable intubating the patient, placing a double lumen, and kind of you know doing it like the VAT style. Mm-hmm. Um, others are okay with um, moderate sedation, oxygen, nasal cannula, and then having an entitled CO2, which I think will be a, the easiest and more convenient way, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but same with me. I mean, my anesthesiologists prefer having some sort of secure airway, even if it's an LMA uh, mm-hmm. or a single lumen ET tube. Uh, I mean, many of them insist on some secure airway for a BAL sometimes. So, you know, it's very difficult for me to sell them <laughs> conscious sedation or MAC uh, for a pleuroscopy. Uh, so, uh, pleuroscopy again, I mean, we're all uh, placing pleurexes at the same time. Are we uh, insufflating duck uh, very often? What are you doing, Matt? Um, <clears throat> depends upon the situation, but not often, uh, <laughs> in general, we're not, not often doing that. Um, it, uh, it's, it's somewhat patient dependent, um, in terms of, uh, uh, whether, we, whether we would do that or not. So, um, it's, it's infrequent to be honest. If we are, if I am using it, it would be just an insufflation of talc, um, um, you know, after the procedure, um, mm-hmm. and it's pretty much it. So through the pleurex or through a chest tube? Yeah, not often through a pleurex. Um, I usually, we haven't, we haven't really gotten into that practice of uh, putting talc through a chest tube very much. Um, it hasn't, um, for whatever reason, it's just, it's just haven't entered our practice of what we're doing frequently. I think some of it has to do with hospitalization time after that. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, and so we're a little cognizant of that. We don't want to keep people in the hospital longer than maybe what we need to. And so um, I, I think um, we just haven't sort of integrated that into our practice right now. Yeah, I've been selling, uh, struggling to sell uh, talc during pleuroscopy to patients. I mean, uh, just with the fact that I prefer them being hospitalized. Uh, after that, just from the pain perspective, monitoring the output from the tube, et cetera. Uh, but I've, I've struggled to sell uh, talc during pleuroscopy uh, to patients. Yeah. Uh, if you do put in talc, how do you do it? What technique do you use? So we have that, um, like that hand pump. So we connect the actual bottle to the hand pump and then basically kind of just instill it throughout the, um, um, throughout the uh, pleural space. So You're talking about the three gram ones which come with the uh, hand pump, the Steritel from Novatec? Yeah. Okay. Uh, any, any different techniques that you've seen being used, like a CO2 insufflator yeah, or, you know? Insufflator. I've only used that once. Um, mm-hmm. I think the uh, surgeons like using it when they're doing their baths. So I've only tried it once, which it sounds a little bit more convenient. I mean, I don't know technically if there's going to be any difference in terms of outcomes, but I think practicality-wise, I think it's a little bit easier to use. And either of you guys performing close plural biopsies anymore? No, no, I'm not. I'm not doing any close plural biopsies at all right now. I have some in my toolkit, but I haven't had to use it yet, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Perfect. Thank you so much, guys. This has been really, really, really informational. And um, I just want to end with asking you if you have any additional points or tips that uh, you would want to give our listeners. I'll allow you first. No, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainties in how we do some of these common procedures. And I think, you know, we still need to work a little bit harder in terms of tweaking which are the things that actually make a difference, which are the things that may not, you know, um, be as helpful as we thought it would. Mm-hmm. And what about you, Matt? No, I don't, have, I don't have too much else to add. There's obviously a lot in each of these different topics and a lot of things that we still need to study and, and understand a little bit better about um, outcomes and best method for pleurodesis around pleuroscopy, as you were alluding to with talc and, and integrating that more into our practice and, and so forth. So it's an exciting time. Still a lot of work to be done. Awesome, man. Exciting podcast. Thank you so much, guys, for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us.